and welcome to a very special webcast that is part of a series I am leading on diversity, equity, and inclusivity with CME Outfitters. I would like to welcome you to today's educational activity titled The Patient Journey, Eliminating Disparities at Every Step. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from Johnson & Johnson. CME Outfitters is an award-winning, jointly accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. I also want to encourage everyone to join us today on our live Twitter conversation at CME Outfitters. We will be monitoring the Twitter feed and responding to your tweets as they come in. I'm Dr. Monica Peek, and I'm a professor of medicine and the associate director of the, uh, Chicago, the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research. I'm also the executive medical director of Community Health Innovation and the director of research at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago here in uh, Chicago, Illinois. I'm really excited to be joined today by my distinguished colleagues, Diane Brusso, Dr. Delon Canterbury, and Dr. Lisa Richardson, who will ask to introduce themselves individually. Oh, hi, I'm uh, PA Diane Brusso, and I'm the Director of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and an Assistant Professor Adjunct at the Yale School of Medicine PA online program. We're located in New Haven, Connecticut, and I also practice clinically in transgender medicine. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Delon Canterbury. I am the founder of Geriatrics. We are a medication management and de-prescribing company led by a geriatric trained pharmacist and I am based in Durham, North Carolina. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Lisa Richardson. I'm an Anishinaabe physician. I'm a staff, I practice internal medicine at Toronto General Hospital in Toronto. I'm also an Associate Dean of Inclusion and Diversity at the Temerity Faculty of Medicine. In addition, I'm the Strategic Lead in Indigenous Health at Women's College Hospital, also in Toronto, and I co-chair the Indigenous Health Committee of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada, which is located, and that college is located in Ottawa, Ontario. Miigwech. All right, thank you so much. What a distinguished panel. I'm so excited to have you all here today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. It's gonna be fabulous. I wanna start by asking our audience a quick polling question. And I'm gonna tell you in advance, we're gonna have several of these throughout the hour. We're not gonna actually give you the answers to the polls um, until the very end, because we're gonna ask them uh, to you again. So the first question um, that you can see on your screen now and go ahead and vote, um, is asking the question about how equality and equity are different. How are they differentiated? Um, the uh, first option A is that equality is, is when all individuals reach the same outcomes. B, equity requires resources to be withheld from overserved populations to ensure the same access to all. C, equity allocates uh, resources to account for individual differences to achieve equal outcomes for all. D, equality modifies achievement criteria to account for individual differences. Or E, I don't know. Excellent. So I want to make sure that we define equality and equity because these terms are often used interchangeably. And if you look in the, the dictionary, they can semantically be used interchangeably, but they really are not the, uh, the same. And within the, the world of disparities and equity, <laughs> uh, we think about them very, very differently. And so um, equality is when we think about giving everyone equal inputs. Uh, if we think about process measures, making sure that everyone has the same thing, whereas equity is thinking about outcomes and trying to have everyone have equal outcomes. And so it may require, and it, it often does, and that's what uh, the evidence has shown us, is that we tailor differently the kind of processes, the kind of inputs that we give different people, different communities based on the differential needs. Um, to get to the same outcome. And so this is a slide, and we, we've seen 
uh, this uh, mocked up with different kinds of images to sort of tell this story in different ways. And this is the most recent one that I've seen that I think tells it best in that we could give everyone the same bicycle. Um, but, you know, some people may be too tall. Um, some people may be too short. Some people um, may not be able to use their legs. Um, and so that would be an example of equality. But what we really want is for everyone to be able to ride their way to the finish line. And so we can design different kinds of bicycles so that everyone um, can do that. Some bikes may be smaller, some are bigger, some allow people to use their hands. And so it's thinking about tailoring um, an instrument, uh, tailoring the delivery of care to meet individual needs of populations. Um, that may require more resources or different resources to get to the same equal outcome. So equality is the same input, equity is the same finish line, the same output. And so that, that's a really big difference. Um, and so now that we have sort of at least that hopefully baseline level of understanding about the difference between equality and equity, we're going to try and talk about um, some other uh, um, constructs that are challenging um, in, in the world that we want to make sure we have a level set for our conversation today. Um, and then, and these are big ones. Um, so the next is around race. Um, and so there's that's that's a whole lecture in and of itself. Um, but we're going to try and just do that quickly here. Um, and our and our main point, um, and and the same applies to. Uh, ethnicity, which is a different construct, but interrelated to race. Um, but the, the point is that race itself is a social construct. It is not a biological or genetic construct. Um, and we can we know that because how we think about race has changed over time. So if we think just within the United States and we look at our U.S. census, over you know the past 100 years, um, how we have defined different racial groupings has changed over time. We can think about how we define race over place in the current, you know, and in today. And so, a, a given person can travel from this country to another country, and their racial category would change depending on how that country would define their race. So some countries define it based on the, the race of the mother. Some countries define it, you know, on, on different things. Here, historically in America, we have defined, for example, um, Black people based on um, whether or not there's any African ancestry um, in you, you know, based on the sort of one drop rule. And that, that is based on the economic history of slavery. And so trying to maximize the number of people that were kept enslaved, then the idea was that anyone who had any African ancestry was deemed to be African-American, Black. Um, and so that's how that definition came about in our country. But again, uh, this these, these definitions change over time and place and space. And so these are social constructs. Now, we it overlaps with the idea of genetics um, because many people who um, have brown skin and look like me originate from Africa, you know? And so there's a genetic uh, component to that. But we have to also acknowledge that the continent that has the most genetic uh, diversity is Africa. So if we think about the North Africa um, and how uh, people there look very much like Middle Eastern um, versus Sub-Saharan Africa, and think about all the, the genetic uh, diversity within that continent, um, Africa is the continent that has the most genetic diversity. And then if we think just about within this country, um, the, the, the people who may have uh, once some of the most genetic diversity are African-Americans, because almost by definition, we um, you could be anything as long as you have one drop of black blood. And so there's so much um, diversity in how black people look um, and uh, the kinds of genes that are mixed in together uh, to make what um, are ultimately um, people of the African diaspora that live in this country that define themselves as African Americans. And so um, there's not, 
There's not like a single, you know, thing that makes black people black. It's a social construct. And so when we are thinking about biology and genetics, we don't want to confuse that with the social construct of, uh, of how we think about race. And so we want to be more precise in our language. And so if we're really looking to see if African-Americans are going to be more sensitive to this, you know, medication, or if there might be, you know, reasons for differences in um, health, then what we really need to be looking at are, are there you know, genetic mutations? Are there certain biological markers within this group of people um, that may have, from an evolutionary standpoint, um, driven them to have developed this? And we use malaria as the case um, where people in Africa and um, certain parts of the world uh, were driven by the malaria and the mosquito to have sickle cell disease. That is not a function of brown skin. It's a function of being exposed to, you know, the mosquito and, uh, and the, the malaria. Um, and so there are more ways to be precise if we want to think about genetics than, than thinking about the color of someone's skin. One thing that I do, uh, two things that I want to note is that um, racial groups tend to have um, some a shared uh, cultural tradition. Um, and part of that is how we define ethnicity, where an ethnic group tends to share cultural traditions. A lot of times they share a nationhood. And so there are interrelated constructs about race and ethnicity, although they're different. Um, but they're both social constructs and not biological ones. The most important thing is that race is a social construct, but race uh, that has no sort of biological meaning but that racism is what can cause biological changes and epigenetic changes that lead to poor health. So it's not race that is a predictor of poor health, it's racism that leads to poor health. And so when we think about that, um, uh, that, that that's an important uh, thing for us to uh, keep in mind as we have our discussion today and as you sort of move about in your own work um, you know, and think about our Black people at increased risk for this, what we really should be asking ourselves are these people um, more at risk for exposure to structural inequities because of their race, um, like we learned with COVID, and then think about what those structural inequities are. Um, okay. So I hope that was somewhat um, useful, just that background I mean, providing some sort of clarity because we know that language matters and we want to be very clear about our language. So we're going to move on to our second audience response question. Um, and you should now be able to see that on your screen and you can vote now. The question is, um, race is a biological risk factor for which of the following disease states? Sickle cell disease, HIV infection, type two diabetes, none of the above, or I'm not sure, I don't know. So go ahead and vote now. And again, we'll vote again at the end and so we'll see our pre-responses and our post-responses. Okay, so one of the unique programs, uh, unique components about our program today is the inclusion of the patient voice. And so with our partner, We Go Health, we reach a large cohort of patient leaders of color and ask them various questions and we'll be weaving their responses into our program. And so I wanna start by sharing a patient response to the question, have you experienced racism, bias, or discrimination in your healthcare experiences? And so let's listen to what person, let's, uh, what one person had to say. I do believe that there is inherent racial, racial bias and discrimination rooted in the healthcare system. Uh, many times going to the emergency room, I experienced delayed care, uh, reduced dose in narcotic medication compared to a white patient, um, sickle cell disease is primarily um, African American disease, especially in the United States. Um, those are not the only patients who have it. Those are usually the patients that are seen. So I do feel like sickle cell patients are discriminated against, even though, um, say, if you compare hematology patients, sickle cell patients versus oncology patients, pain is a 
primary symptom of our disease process, you will see that they get prescribed higher levels, more frequent narcotics, more consistently than sickle cell patients do. I think it's a common occurrence and one that needs to be stopped because, of course, we're not drug seeking. We're just trying to get help for the disease process that we were born. Uh, had a whole lot of great she was talking sickle cell um, and which is a disease that we I was just talking about sort of the biology versus you know the little um, how it's a disease that um, it has a lot of uh, those patients are differentially treated um, in general within our healthcare system. So, so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Lisa and see what your thoughts are regarding this patient's experience. And can you also elaborate on race and the negative impact of treating race as a biological risk factor? Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Peek. And I think you did such a great job of outlining the difference between race and racism. And, you know, hearing the clip that we just heard, we clearly actually heard about the experience of racism within a healthcare encounter. So receiving, you know, waiting longer in the emergency department, getting lower doses of medication. So being in pain and not having P um, care providers respond to, um, to your pain needs. What is really important to understand is that when we, if we assumed, the problem with assuming that race is a biological, is biological, which as you've explained, it is not, is we overlook the fact that it is racism that is leading often to differential health, health outcomes. We must actually look at experiences of racism at the interpersonal level, such as what was described in that encounter by the patient, the experiences of prejudice, but also think about structural racism, which manifests with differential experiences, differential access to food, to housing, to um, economic opportunities, to educational opportunities. Those are the social determinants of health that often will fall along, will be divided along race, and so hence leads to differential health outcomes. I think the second piece that's outlined on the slide that we have to think about is what does the chronic exposure to stress actually do in terms of long-term health impacts? Well, I don't think anyone is going to be surprised to, to know that actually research shows that chronic stress lead has impacts on long-term health. And that because of these social determinants that I was speaking about earlier, um, it is more likely that people who are uh, from racial and ethnic groups that are underserved actually will carry more stress, uh, such as lower socioeconomic status, poor access to equitable health care, limited access to resources, the interpersonal and systemic discrimination that was highlighted so well in the, in the clip that we heard, exposure to unsafe environments, environmental hazards, social disadvantage in terms of opportunities in working and learning environments, etc., so really critical to understand that it is, uh, we must understand uh, the, the social construction of race and the resultant racism and its impact on social determinants of health, because that differential effect is related to structural and systemic racism as causing the disparities. And of course, if we, if we just said, oh, race is biological, can't do anything about it, then there's no impetus to act for change. Thank you so much, Lisa, uh, for that insight. Um, one thing that I think is uh, really important to discuss is kind of how we got here. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to give sort of an overview with this slide, but much of what we're going to be talking about today are details around this. So the foundational points regarding sort of historical and structural racism are so important. And so we've covered these topics in depth in prior programs. So I'm going to sort of summarize it here, but also recognize that we're going to hit some of these uh, throughout the program here as well. Um, and so when we're talking about uh, systemic racism, uh, we're what we mean by that are uh, structural inequities that are due to race. And so these are uh, 
how we think about the social determinants of health and how they are unequally distributed um, because of racism. So unequal health, um, access to stable housing, um, limited access to education and job opportunities, increased exposure to, to crime and poverty, um, all of those based on race, um, decreased um, access to fresh food, um, sort of basic things that we need or we consider to be human rights. Um, and in addition to uh, thinking about things that are um, part of the, the neighborhood, part of the, the social and uh, built environment, uh, things like, uh, as well as the natural environment, things like toxins. We always uh, think about the, the, the landfills, but other kinds of things that are in the water, in the air, um, that are more likely to be physically located next to um, racialized minority communities. Um, and that's outside of the healthcare system. Within the healthcare system, we think about um, disproportionate um, uh, access to healthcare and healthcare uh, provider bias. And so uh, we then think about what are the impacts of these structural inequities. Um, and so um, of this uh, systemic racism, we can think about deviations from standards of care or differential, like I was saying, differential uh, treatment or healthcare delivery by race. Um, we can think about how the HPA axis has been activated to elevate uh, stress and cortisol, um, to increase uh, things like autonomic dysregulation, uh, manifest in uh, mental health disorders, cardiovascular disease, etc. Um, and ultimately, um, we find that healthcare spaces may not feel like safe spaces for persons of color. And so we see people disengaging um, or going <laughs> um, way later than, than, than we know they should to, for care. And so um, we saw this, um, a lot of people predicted that this would happen um, with, the, with the pandemic. Much of the pandemic um, was about uh, differential access, but ultimately there was some hesitancy um, because of the institutional mistrust, um, earned distrust um, with uh, our healthcare systems. And so we think about the, the chronic pro-inflammation, inflama uh, uh, pro-inflammatory states um, from that result from chronic racism, as well as how people are interacting with the healthcare systems that are supposed to be treating all of this um, healthcare um, these adverse health events. And so structural racism is this thing um, that ultimately gets under people's skin and affects their health. Um, and then when we go to healthcare places for treatment, um, people may delay in getting there and have differential care once there. And so it's important that we have sort of this pre-discussion about these very foundational topics. So now I think we're ready uh, for our first learning objective, which is to analyze racial and uh, ethnic health disparities that result in health inequities in patient care. So um, Delon, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, and if we look at health inequities as a whole, um, what is their impact on the monetary costs to this country? And can you share some of that data with us? Absolutely. And thank you, Dr. Richardson, for that wonderful intro and the insights thus far. So let's be honest, this is an ongoing problem, okay? We have health inequities, unfortunately, ingrained within our very own system and structurally. And so they cost almost about $320 billion, as we can see, in annual healthcare sin. I work more in the geriatric world. And so having the addition of housing crisis, of and food deserts, food insecurities, we're seeing this hit all populations, sure, but our seniors more particularly in my world are definitely being double affected to the impact where hospitals and health systems are turning into makeshift nursing homes. And again, this is costing that health system money. And this is, again, taking a bed away from someone who may be needing more urgent care. So this issue of health inequity doesn't just touch healthcare, it touches housing, education, it touches your zip code, it touches literally everything within the system. And so this cost is compounded as we see and loses productivity per year, about $42 billion, okay? And so we're seeing even on the slide as well that Black people are two times as likely to have 
Alzheimer's disease with unfortunately less diagnoses within this group. And to even add to the points on the slide, that's not even highlighting the caregiver that's dedicating their time and their resources and their navigation of a system where they still feel perpetually unheard in that care. So that is a stress. And you'd be surprised how many caregivers are being hospitalized before their loved ones uh, who are maybe uh, dealing with a chronic condition pass. And so mm -hmm. it's becoming a generational strain of the inequity. And it's not just a, oh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act passed and now it's all over. We, it's ingrained. It's in the laws. And we as providers do have an onus to, to take charge in that and be aware of that. And also just see it's more than just what you may perceive as a phenotype or as a skin color. And so we're even still seeing, again, Black and Latino patients having less of that diagnosis, as I mentioned, with dementia. So that could probably translate to less of those resources that are, one, language friendly for such a demographic to manage and navigate that care. But now we're even seeing more women of color who are becoming that caregiver and helping those with dementia. And so they likely, in some cases, are still raising families while being a caregiver. So these costs are there. Sure, we have the numbers that show that. But there's also this unperceived indirect cost, whether it's absenteeism, chronic stress, and the tons of other isms we can add to this. So I just want to make sure we show the entire picture here outside of just a cost. But there is a cost. And we need to start looking at ways to reinvest these these wealth gaps and, mm -hmm. and have establishments between community and private payers to really move the needle on this. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and unfortunately, there are many instances of disparities in medical care and our patient uh, who spoke about sickle cell disease. Another one that comes to mind that isn't talked about enough is the HIV epidemic. Um, so Diane, as the clinical ambassador of the CDC Stop HIV Together campaign, can you talk a little bit about, talk a little bit and shed some light on that for us? Thank you, Dr. Peek. Um, as this slide represents there is a disproportionate burden of HIV incidence in Black and Hispanic communities. 41% of new HIV diagnoses were among Black patients, while the Black community represents less than 20% of the population. And 29% of new HIV diagnoses were among Hispanic and Latinx patients. And again, the community represents less than 20% of the population. Um, Another example would be of the 18% of women who are diagnosed with, a, with HIV, 42% of Black women. And COVID really exacerbated this further. Maybe you're familiar with the term syndemics, which is uh, when the disparities in one epidemic really compound another with this exponential impact. And that's exactly what happened here uh, over the last few years with um, COVID and HIV. And in terms of prevalence, um, and I want to speak to the intersectionality for a moment. 42% of transgender women are living with HIV, 62% are Black trans women, 35% are Latina, and I want you to contrast this with the 17% of white trans women who are living with HIV. So while we're making tremendous progress in ending the HIV epidemic, the total number of HIV transmissions is going down year over year, but progress is not being delivered to all communities equally. And that downward trend, it's not happening fast enough to meet our goals of ending the HIV epidemic by 2030. I really appreciate this quote from Dr. Volko, and it reminds me to recognize our responsibility to expand prevention and care to those who need it most, going back to equity and quality that Dr. Peek spoke to at the very beginning. So to achieve this, stigma and structural racism and other forms of systemic barriers have to be mitigated. And in terms of HIV, you know, healthcare professionals like us need to do a better job of creating that access to HIV prevention, testing, and treatment for those who, who need it most and are not accessing it currently. Thank you. Um, Dr. Canterbury, can you take us through some of the data regarding inequities in other chronic diseases and the patients that are impacted? I think since I'm the internist, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. Um, because in fact, these rep 
represent a lot of the, you know, a lot of the patients I see in my practice. So um, I, you know, I, th I think it's really important, like these data, these, these slides are going to be uh, heavy in, da in data. And I think it's important to see the numbers. But I also want us to remember that under behind every number, there is um, a patient a family member, one of our own community members, and to really be be honing in on that. Of course, we need to see this data, um, but I think many of us in these communities are, are well aware of it. Um, so, so to start with, for example, when we're speaking about um, diabetes, we know that Black adults are 60% more likely than white adults to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and two to three times more likely to have complications from the diabetes. Um, we know that white patients conversely account for 80 and 77 percent of hip and knee replacement surgeries in the U.S. despite comprising only 62 percent of the total population. We also know that Black and Hispanic patients are three times more likely to be under-medicated for cancer pain than patients in non-underserved populations, and uh, the risk of receiving no analgesic while in the emergency department was 66% greater for Black patients than for white patients. A lot of data now emerging around the impact of homelessness on health. And just one example, thinking about those social determinants and intersectionality, as Diane was speaking about, people who are homeless have three times a greater risk of, of cardiovascular disease and an increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality. And when we adjust for insurance, uh, education level and income, Black patients are 20% less likely to receive a DOAC, so um, evidence-based treatment of anticoagulation for their atrial fibrillation. So just a clear example of that racism at the interpersonal level that we all have a duty to interrupt in our practices as clinicians. Um, some more slides here around uh, the impacts of, of uh, chronic disease, and in this case, the focus on maternal health. Um, in the U.S., um, non-Hispanic Black women and birthing people die at rates of 2.9, so almost three times greater mortality than their non-Hispanic white counterparts. Um, and maternal and infant mortality rates tend to be much worse in states with larger uh, non-Hispanic Black populations. Um, in terms of maternal morbidity, non-Hispanic, Black, Hispanic, um, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and um, American Indian and Alaskan Native patients are at much greater risk of multiple uh, uh, comorbidities, uh, multiple poor outcomes, including DIC, shock, acute renal failure, hemorrhage, and preeclampsia, eclampsia, and the HELP syndrome. And non-Hispanic Black individuals have higher rates of maternal mental health conditions, including postpartum depression. So what we're seeing here, because we started, we heard the vignette around experience in the emergency department. We heard Dr. Canterbury speaking about some of the data in um, patients with, with uh, around dementia and caregivers, and Diane speaking about the impact in HIV, and then all of this data here around chronic illness and maternal health. So just a broad range of data to support what um, many of us know. Absolutely. And one of the things that you had mentioned that was so striking was about the DOACs. Um, and so all of the disparities are horrible, but some of them, I think, have so um, many uh, larger uh, implications, because when we think about those versus Coumadin, which requires all the extra visits for the INRs and the medication adjustments, which means that there are extra you know, prescription refills, you know, multiple, you know, refills as opposed to staying on a stable boat dose for a period of time. And so, you know, we think about the burden of managing Coumadin, but the, the real burden is for patients. And so to have an alternative medication, particularly ones that we now know um, can be covered at a lower rate, a sort of lower cost than when they first came out, um, and, and to have huge disparities in those and to not be on those, particularly when the risk for the disease being treated, you know, strokes and atrial fibrillation, which causes strokes, you know, is, are so high. Um, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's really a travesty. Um, so I'm going to, we're going to switch and in, in, in move 
a little bit more from some of the the data. <laughs> um, and I'm going to ask you to share some of your thoughts about bias and medical mistrust and and what you think is going on there. Yeah, so I think that I think so much, Dr. Peek. I think that what's really clear is when, you know, as I said, as I was presenting the data, I said, well, people in our communities know about this data because many of these people represent their families and um, ha and either have experienced this themselves or um, are experiencing it, are, uh, their family members have experienced it. So they're witnessing it. So I think what we need to what we need to first talk about is um, ex implicit versus explicit bias. And then we're going to talk about the idea of mistrust at the healthcare system. So implicit bias impacts all aspects of care. And when we think about the fact that those, you know, patients, um, Black patients are not receiving DOACs, it's not being prescribed. What is the implicit bias in the provider that's actually causing them to actually omit the, uh, st the standard of care? So that's an example of really having to, um, for those who are not aware of their biases, to do the work of unearthing what your implicit biases are. It leads to the explicit or the conscious bias of actually not uh, not prescribing. And, and again, these are things that all of uh, many people's witness or have experienced. And so I think what's really important when we talk about medical mistrust is that you're likely to mistrust a system where you have seen your loved ones or where you have been excluded or mistreated. And so although we often, you know, we talk about mistrust as lying with the patient or with the at the community level, I think what we have to understand is that it actually is due to a system that has built, been built up to be exclusive and that continues to enact these exclusive practices, discriminatory practices, and racist practices. And it, I think the other piece to remember is that it's not historical. You know, a common, commonly there's this people will hear, oh, get over it. Like things, you know, that happened a long time ago. Why, why haven't you gotten, gotten over it? Where's, why is your community not able to recover? Well, the abuse is ongoing. Right. And the systemic <laughs> discrimination and racism is ongoing. It's still happening. Um, and, you know, for example, just Back in 2003, members of the Hasupai tribe in Arizona found that their own uh, genetic DNA, that genetic samples that had been collected for studies on diabetes, were then being used for studies on schizophrenia, migration, inbreeding, all sorts of very sensitive topics that they had never consented. To. So that's a very recent finding. There are many others. We all have examples of what's happening daily in our hospitals and in our clinics. And this is why we really uh, have to, when we talk about mistrust of the healthcare system, I shift it to, well, what are we doing wrong in the healthcare system? And how do we actually build that trust back? Absolutely. Um, and I think that a lot of the conversation um, since the pandemic has shifted to how can we be trustworthy as providers and as healthcare institutions, as opposed to like, why don't people want this vaccine? Like, why are they so, you know, so hesitant and mistrustful? Like we, because I think people are more interested now because we are recognizing the interconnectivity of all of us together. And we're only as strong as the weakest link among us. And so, you know, it's all going to come back to everyone unless we are all able to engage in the healthcare system. Um, and so how can that system have everyone's trust, not just a few people's trust? Um, so thank you so much. Um, this is just really a powerful points. Um, so if we have another audience response question, um, you should now uh, see that on your screen. Um, and you can go ahead and answer that now. The um, So which of the following groups, and there's so many groups that can be uh, um, have the experienced disparities, but which of the following groups experience the greatest mental health related disparities? Is it A, transgender persons, B, non-Hispanic white males, C, women over 65 years of age, D, millennials, they're always having issues, um, or E, I don't know. All right. So 
So Diane, I'm going to turn this over to you. Just like we've been talking about racial and ethnic biases, there are also biases related to gender and sexual orientation. What can you tell us about that? Uh, thanks, Dr. P. So there are many situations where biases occur related to sex and gender, and I'm just going to share two illustrations. One is how women generally aren't receiving the same access to cardiac care while being overtreated for mental health and specifically internalizing disorders like depression and anxiety, while men are having the opposite experience and um, being undertreated for depression. Mm -hmm. I don't know of another community more impacted by stigma than young black transgender women. I've already spoken to how that plays out in HIV. Um, the result though of stigma is and associated with a lack of support and a lack of affirmation. And there's years of data that uh, speaks to how this results in an increase in unhealthy behaviors, including substance use disorder and suicidality, which we can resolve by resolving the stigma, right? Um, healthcare professionals were not immune to being influenced by stigma and bias. Almost half of all transgender and non-binary patients report mistreatment and discrimination at the hands of their healthcare provider. One of the ways that stigma is experienced by sexual minorities is when sexual identity, specifically sexual minority identities like gay, lesbian, and bisexual is seen as proxy for high risk sexual behavior. And we know that sexual identity and sexual behavior are different constructs with incomplete concordance. So to be explicit, we can't assume a patient's behavior just based on their identity. Um, there's a term, the uh, transgender broken arm syndrome that was coined in the transgender community. And it refers to a scenario that's all too common. And it's represented by a transgender person who tries to access medical care for a broken arm and is advised by the healthcare provider that they can't help the transgender patient for their broken arm because they weren't trained in the care of transgender patients. In the situation, the patient's gender diversity has nothing to do with their broken arm or strep throat or whatever it is the patient's there for. But all the provider sees is that patient's gender identity. Assumptions and stigma are also experienced uh, in the uh, aging sexual and gender minority communities who are in uh, assisted living and nursing facilities. And, and today there's similar um, stigma that's also playing out around the monkeypox um, uh, epidemic that we're experiencing where anyone who's um, uh, experiencing or uh, come, come up, come down with monkeypox has been either assumed to be gay or um, ultimately stigmatized as a result of it. And I think we have a, a clip to uh, illustrate this. A few years ago when I was living in Virginia, I um, went to see a doctor about an a issue on the backside and my doctor sent me to a surgeon who was a specialty in that area. And he turns around, he uh, basically insulted me, hurt my feelings and all that, made me feel left up a human being because first of all, I was gay and HIV positive. And he basically caught his examining me from across the room. It upset me deeply because I know he knew before he came in the room that I was HIV positive and yet he acted the way he did. I went back to my doctor and told him what happened. And I told him he shouldn't refer anyone to this man because the way he, he act and what he did with me. Okay, I was very hurt on the uh, issue. It was to the point where I cried because I was so hurt and so angry. You know, Diane, one of the questions that has come up, uh, there's a primary doctor, primary care doctor who asked if there are specific resources or places that are specifically like safe homes, safe places where people can come for who are LGBTQIA to get safe care, um, you know, maybe specializing um, in care for that population. I, I live in Chicago, so we do have those kinds of clinics, but not um, every uh, city is large enough to have the bandwidth. Um, are there? What do you What do you recommend? So I I, I understand where you're coming from. There's there are federally qualified health centers that specialize. Um, uh, you know, 
sexual and gender minorities are considered underserved, medically underserved populations, which is something I think that kind of goes under the radar sometimes. Um, but I hope that the folks that are in this room with us uh, will be able to reach the folks in their community without those, without community members, sexual gender minority community members needing to go for specialized care. I think it's, I think it's on all of us uh, to be able to get this right. Absolutely. Um, and then just one other question or, or comment that someone said that uh, some members of her team, it sounds like maybe some younger members, I, I, I'm not sure, um, said that uh, some people have been very vocal about like, there are just too many terms these days. Um, and yes. I think maybe, <laughs> um, how would you advise uh, this uh um, this person to sort of talk to their team member who says like, I don't want to learn like right. all these, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Language is, is changing, ever changing. And it's it, what it is today is not how it's going to be tomorrow. And I totally get it. So I really appreciate the, um, the uh, framework of cultural humility as opposed to cultural competence. Right. So our patient knows things about themselves that we don't know, and we're going to have to ask them about it, right? So, you know, uh, we just have to ask our patients, hey, you know, how would you like me to address you? Um, hey, you know, use gender neutral terminology around spouses and partners until the patient advises us what their circumstances. So uh, it's it's challenging, um, but, it, but it definitely has an outcome. And as we heard from the audio clip, it makes a huge, huge difference when we can get this right for patients. Exactly. Um... Ultimately, as providers, we should be concerned in patient outcomes. And we know that there are lots of ways to get to good health. Some of those are by addressing people's environment, those social determinants of health. Um, some of those are by helping patients feel like their full humanity and dignity is addressed, as the last clip showed. I mean, the poor the man cried. How often do men cry? You know, um, and so when we can help people feel like they are seen by the healthcare system, um, and if that means um, taking on the burden of learning how people want to be addressed, then I think that that should be you know, how that we think about, although we learned a whole new language when we entered the healthcare system, you know, we learned that this is not called the collarbone, it's called the clavicle. So we, we took and we just, we figured we, we didn't, you know, bad an eye about that, that burden. And so I think the resistance to learn a few extra names really reflects a bias about, you know, wanting to embrace um, a, a way of, um, addressing people's full humanity. Um, because it's not that we aren't always having continuing education, that we're not, you know, averse to the idea of always, you know, having continual learning. I think there's something else that's underneath that, um, that, that is uh, blocking that person. But we need to understand that this is ultimately for the best health for our patients. And that's why we're showing up every day. Um, so, so anyway. Thank you for that. <laughs> We could talk about any of these subjects all day long, um, but we uh, don't have all day. So we are going to move. So thank you for the great discussion. We're going to move uh, to another um, audience question. And I think this may be the last one um, before we start uh, repeating them. It, it may not. Um, so we're. Uh, you should be able to see this on your screen. Um, and the question is, which of the following is not a social determinant of health domain? A, economic stability. B, education access and quality. C, neighborhood and built environment. D, race and ethnicity. Or E, I don't know. And my guess is that we're going to have some confusion here. We'll see. Um, so please vote now. All right, the anticipation is building up for the answers. Um, so, uh, Dr. Canterbury, what can you tell us about the social determinants of health? Um, and then before uh, we start talking about those, it's just to sort of recognize they can be positive or negative. 
um, and how they may impact health inequities. And then can you run us through the different kinds of social determinants of health? Oh, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, as we can see here, pretty clearly stated, uh, these social determinants of health are really what dictate the majority of our health outcomes, about 80 to 90 percent. And they range around from what church may be in your community, what type of social support do you have, education, food insecurity, the list can go on. And so in talking about this, we know that this is where our outcomes will come from. So how can we really truly try to hit and support people in need who may have some of these social insecurities? There are five domains around social determinants of health, but we can even see, again, based on your zip code, um, how differences in that zip code can impact, again, true quality care. And so there is, of course, a biopsychosocial feedback loop. When it comes to social barriers, right, I worked in the COVID task force here around the Durham, North Carolina area. We saw an immediate need for screening and testing for COVID. And unfortunately, it wasn't being addressed in those of most need. So it took community stakeholders to truly have testing that's literally done 10 miles away to be put in the most communities, of course, uh, that were lacking. So again, touching on that social structure, that was what was needed in this example of COVID screening before there were vaccines. But again, trying to bridge where people are driving two hours away who had a little more time, a little more uh, access to have that ability to drive two hours to a low income community to get screened. That again, I think is a poignant example of differences in some of those social determinants of health and barriers that lead to those outcomes. So as I kind of overviewed cursorily, um, this can stem from anything from occupation, jobs, of course, what you may have as assets financially, what kind of support you may have, what kind of community support you may have. So of course, the first tenant comes down to economics. What's around you? Is there an opportunity for jobs? Um, how can we address medical costs? Uh, if there's even medical debt, that's another issue as well, as well as the number of dependents you may have. And that may vary from culture to culture. As another point, education plays a pretty huge role as well, uh, especially when it comes to health literacy and most importantly, I'd say language, how we're communicating in the language of the person we're trying to treat. We've seen it time and time again, how much your higher education can impact those outcomes. Even access to internet became a huge issue. We can't just send people to, to, to go to school from home and assume everyone has the internet, you see. And that became, uh, essentially, there were grant fundings to help put that internet into those rural communities to bridge those gaps. So technology, again, plays a role along with this educational piece. On another level, there's, of course, simple access to just health, period, right? Who's the, the local provider that's nearby? How many patients to provider ratios are there? Is it a, a HRSA or low income, uh, I'm sorry, uh, zip code or region that's being treated like we see most in our rural communities? So again, trying to bridge those gaps. And I do see telehealth being a, a huge role in trying to do that, but we still have long ways to go in terms of infrastructure, as well as, again, access to just general basic health insurance. Of course, neighborhood stability and safety can play a huge role. In my work with the COVID task force, we had to build pretty strong partnerships with the Meals on Wheels and other food banks and hitting some of those social needs while empowering about other ways to advocate for, in this case, vaccination against COVID. But transportation, especially in our seniors, is a huge gap. I mean, there are patients who are missing dialysis clinics because they can't afford a bus ride to go downtown or whatever the case may be, or they may not have a loved one who's supporting them to give them a ride. So again, neighborhood safety plays a role. And with the pandemic, we've seen spikes in abuse at home, domestic violence, uh, all these may play a role. So if you're worried about blood pressure, but they're worried about whether I'm gonna make it home safely, that's a whole nother context of a conversation you'd have to have. So definitely keep that in perspective when it comes to just general my day to day. Yep. And I think we have an audio clip here. In the past, I have had limitations where lack of transportation definitely was a factor in me being able to get to the healthcare appointment. I lived in an area where they did not really have bus service, 
so it was very hard to get back and forth to your health care providers. My insurance did provide transportation, but a lot of times it was not on time. And some of these health care providers, they, if they're specialty um, providers, you know, you can't get in until two or three months. Then you've made the appointment and you don't have the transportation, you don't have the resources to get there, or if the, the ride is late, you know, they don't want you to come 15, 20 minutes late because they have other people to service that day. So I'm not really sure how the health care providers, um, how they feel about that. I've only been able to speak, like, to the receptionist or, like, the medical assistant who was handling that kind of thing. So I've never known in any of my instances where a health care provider has tried to make any arrangements or accommodate any of my needs. Such a powerful testimony um, to the reality of our day-to-day, right? We know it's, sure, COVID, recession, all the blight we have on the news, but this is the day-to-day for someone, and they're trying to right. get the care. You know, this is someone motivated to get the care, right? And, and to not have that, what, 3 to $5 cost one way, which, again, may seem small to some, but a ton to others. That's, again, the basis of why we're here today is to bridge those gaps and show that empathy behind what, all of this. Right. Right. All right. Yes. Okay. So yes, yes, this is another great one as well, talking about just the lived history of social uh, racism. And again, I appreciated uh, someone mentioning earlier that this is not just ancient history. This is a very lived experience. I mean, even during COVID, there was a Black doctor who died live and filmed her Facebook testimony just to get the help she needed. And that's something I'll remember as a clinician. And that's what, guess what? My patients will remember because we live this every day. And so having to address not just the elephant in the room, but take it head on, take it head on as the conversation. Because yes, you're going to hear, well, why should I get the shot? I'm using COVID a lot because I I worked on the COVID task force, but referring to the example of the Tuskegee experiment, we, we have yet to really nationally apologize. It took Bill Clinton in the nineties to start talking about that. So you can't expect people to just be bought in without having this, this uh, again, this elephant in the room conversation, I call it. And it's really just level setting with coming to the fact this is a lived, ingrained experience. Unfortunately, maybe not going away as soon as I would like, but it's something that's happening now from the person who's parking their car and seeing an attendant and walking in and saying hi to the front desk associate. So understanding that that discrimination is very real and I As you can tell, maybe I'm a Black pharmacist. I've gotten my own discrimination within my own schooling at a top school, okay? And I can talk to countless doctors who say the same thing within residency programs and within the didactic. Yes, Dr. Pete raised her hand. It's such reality. And so it's never going to leave me. It's a part of my story. But again, that's how I'm able to empower others. And again, I think it just starts with having that understanding, just basic understanding that it's not going to be the same cookie cutter story everyone else has. Um, and even further, when we talked about genetics, you know, I look like a black man, but my family's from South Ab- South America. My family's Guyanese. So I got a genetic test just to see what kind of enzymes will do differently. And I'm an intermediate metabolizer for four different main cytochrome, I know we're getting to the weeds, but cytochrome pathways. So again, it's not a monolith and we may have different cultures. And in fact, I could be speaking fluent Spanish and suddenly I'm Latino. You see what I'm saying? So we can't go off what we see physically. And Again, I want to just reiterate how that lived experience starts from the minute you walk into that clinical facility. Great. And so um, I think these are great examples of how it is the, not not the fact that you have brown skin, but it's just people's reaction to that brown skin. Um, It's not race, but it's racism. Um, that is the challenge, that is the social determinant of health. Um, and so uh, that that is driving not just these poor health outcomes, but is sort of a layer on top that is disproportionately um, distributing all, ex- other existing things that we know to be social determinants of health, like poverty and crime and, and um, you know, access to basic human uh, needs. Um, and so One thing that I'll note is that we tend to think about social determinants of health in the negative 
because we're talking about what can impact health sort of uh, in, in the negative way. But there are also things within um, racialized minority communities that are protective um, and that have allowed these very marginalized, oppressed communities to survive. You know, it's like, how, like, how do we do it? <laughs> you know, without, you know, over time, how have we managed to stay together, to stay healthy, to not be, you know, crushed under the boot heel? Um, and so these are things that I think that we need to be also investigating. Um, the kinds of, of things that I think um, have made, uh, have made it livable over the you know generations that for communities to have survived. And so um, Dr. Richardson, I want you to talk a bit about um, how we can think about the protective effects of culture and community that help um, um, sort of uh, sort of mitigate these negatives and how we can frame that in terms of social determinants of health as well. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Peak. Um, and and I think I think it's really important to move from that deficit-based model to the strengths-based model because um, you know, it's we need to speak about the health gaps and the disparities. And we need to understand that they're built into the systems that we're living within and working within. But we also need to understand the strength within all of our communities that actually do offer that protection. And so this slide really does speak to um, many different examples um, that, that support this idea that um, just as there are the social determinants that undermine our health, there are also these other factors that actually protect us. So if uh, First Nations, regardless of their living conditions have social structure and physical traditional activities, land-based activities that go back to um, how uh, how we've lived traditionally, they are very protective, actually. And so some incredible examples, for example, of land-based uh, treatment programs for people with diabetes or people, poor people with substance use disorders and a good body of evidence emerging, emerging around that. Um, that Asian Indian patients benefit from social support interventions, such as um, the family, your network of family and friends who are providing that instrumental support and can actually, that can translate to support around medication adherence and um, and of course the the improvement in health based on that that older Mexican Americans living in neighborhoods where there was a high density of people from within community had better self-rated health um, which is called the barrio effect mm -hmm. and some of the um, other potential mechanisms that may protect again because we've talked about those negative social determinants of health those that undermine such as low SES and economic distress which um, present in the Mexican-American neighborhoods, which, uh, based on this study, actually led to high levels of social co cohesion, material and emotional resources, strong family structures and traditions, high involvement in the labor force, et cetera. So even, you know, even uh, the response to those um, experiences of structural discrimination or the um, the negative social determinants of health demonstrate the resilience within communities that then becomes protective. So not that I'm suggesting that we need to actually um, always be resilient. We need to actually take away that need, but we also need to understand the strengths of culture, of community, of traditional activities, of family supports, community supports, et cetera, to actually protect the well being of individuals and really work from those community based models, those strengths based models that leverage that strength. Absolutely. What a wonderful way to finish our first learning objective. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, so we're going to move on to our second learning objective, um, which is to develop a team-based approach to improve the patient experience during visits. So Dr. Canterbury, can you talk about the team-based approach to care and how important each member of the team is to optimizing care? And this slide has lots of different people. So um, it really sort of gets to the heart of like how many people can be part of the team and how it's not just about the physician and the patient. So talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and it's absolutely right. We, we honestly, we have to have a team-based care model 
uh, regardless of what we're talking about in healthcare, it needs to be just done. Uh, we we all have our own expertise and we all have a role to play together. And in doing this type of community work, it, it does truly take a village. And I would say one of the most uh, dependent upon, at least in terms of COVID outreach for us, was leveraging the power of community health workers and community health ambassadors and upskilling them to have some of those ways to triage to mid-levels and higher level practitioners. Uh, and in my work, I serve as a pharmacist by trade, but a lot of the outreach I did was simply education at, at faith-based communities and town halls with nurse providers, with PAs, with other mental health specialists as we're dealing with a crisis, because we're not just treating the arm if everyone's sick, we're treating the entire body. So we need that mental health approach. We need that specialist and we need a close knit community of providers having eyes on the same patient or in this case, community. So I, I highly love. I mean, it just needs to be done, frankly, across the board. I mean, we we may do it, it may be fragmented, but frankly, having that advocate, having that voice um, has been shown to be very effective in improving those outcomes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and not just for patients, but also for um, the staff themselves. When everyone is working together at the top of their license, um, people feel better and happier in the workplace. Um, and can, you know, when they bring their best game to work and feel respected for their opinions, um, it's a happier place. You have lower turnover, um, and that ultimately results in better patient care also. And so it's just a win-win. Um, so talk to me about community pharmacists. You're a pharmacist. Um, <laughs> so talk to me about community pharmacists. Sure. Uh, you know, 90% of our country is within five miles of a pharmacy. And so as we've seen in this pandemic, they have been critical in not only the vaccination of our people, but getting into those places that are hard to reach. And one thing I've been able to learn was how expansive and versatile the role of pharmacists can be, whether it's going to someone's home, working in mobile clinics, working again in the faith-based communities, going where the people are, using your access, of course, to reach others in a in a, in a cohesive way. And so one of my loves is de-prescribing. I, I'm a geriatric pharmacist by trade. And so I look for ways to teach not just the patient, but the caregivers on how to advocate against maybe taking too many meds for maybe one condition. So trying to start with simple things that maybe is, are you on more than five to seven meds? Like how long have you been on it? Is it still working? Uh, do you have any side effects? Are you comfortable with your body? What can you tell us so we can better advocate for you? And education's half the battle. And so in order to get that potential medicine de-prescribed in my world, it will start with someone saying, you know what? Let's have a conversation about the meds. Let's talk about what we can do to get rid of this. And so one mnemonic that can be used to help those who may be trying to become more culturally sensitive that I've learned about is the ethnics clinical tool. Essentially, in, in my world, I, I have a Caribbean background and my way of treating a cold is Vicks Vapor Rub and Tiger Bomb and put some stuff <laughs> on your socks, like really like old school, right? And herbal based. But again, it's good to have, and I, I specifically look for providers that are have a Caribbean background because they can relate to that. So that's one method of using this ethnics tool is trying to empathize where people are coming from, whether they may re resort to a healer or spiritual advisor or shaman, whatever their culture may be, um, whether they're willing to collaborate, whether they think about that person's intervention in that person's case. This can be a tool that may be helpful in at least becoming more aware of some of these sensitivities and looking for a, a guideline to at least have a, a patient-centric model of addressing some of these differences that you may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's really important um, I, because sometimes the pharmacists are not physically in the same building. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, not everyone in the healthcare team thinks about how important that pharmacists can be for patient education for, you know, so many things. Um, and, you know, uh, I rely a lot on my pharmacists because, you know, 
you guys love to teach, you know, rather than just like filling, filling meds like that. And that's important. Um, but patient education at, at the point of sale when they're actually picking up their medications and everyone has to sign that little thing that says I was, you know, counseled by my pharmacist or not. We, we do that for a reason. You guys are trained to do that counseling. And so, you know, when they're getting their inhaler, I'll say, you know, you're going to pick it up from the pharmacist have them show you how to use it. They can, yes, they can. They know how to do this. And so really thinking about all the members of the team who may ultimately touch my patient, even if they're not in the same building. So thank you so much for that. The other thing that I want to add is just how important all the team members are who may not typically be uh, seen as a healthcare provider. So the front desk staff, um, the, the, the people who work in the parking garage, um, everyone who comes into contact with the patient before they get to see me will impact how impact that patient experience. Um, and I have had days where by the time I get to see the patient, this actually happened last week. She was like, she looks so upset. And I was like, what is wrong? And she's like, I was about to turn around and leave. I'm like, you just got here. You know, and she's like, everyone who I have encountered before I saw you, you know, was so, you know, I don't know if everyone's having a bad day, but, you know, I, I just, you know, I've, I've still been living kind of in a shell because of the pandemic. I've been frightened. And so to leave my home and, you know, and so all of that really impacts how people are perceiving their healthcare experience. And it's not just about me. And so if we can, you know, again, have people at that front desk, have everyone be part of that team um, and educated on, you know, hey, did you know that, uh, you know, asking your, your doctor questions can help them know that you're interested in your care and you're more likely to get, you know, extra, you know, whatever. The, the, all of that, all of that um, helps the patient. And it, again, it helps those team members. And so really uh, thinking about, um, and particularly because there's a lot of times cultural coordinate concordance and racial concordance between um, the, the medical assistant staff, the um, front desk staff, et cetera, and the patients that you're serving, no matter if it's a, you know, you're in Chinatown or on the South side of Chicago, usually the physicians are more likely to be, you know, white heterosexual men. Um, and the, the patients um, may or may not be, and the patients will frequently reflect the, the staff um, that are serving them. And so thinking about how to um, engage the staff in ways um, and the surrounding community that they're living in, how can we partner with those community-based organizations and the people that are in there? Um, because that's where they're going to be getting their food, shopping, navigating for all these things that we're telling them to do. Can we um, think about addressing those social determinants of health in ways that are above and beyond just a referral? Um, and so, so all of these things um, are really, really important um, as we think about, you know, how we're defining and redefining a team-based care. Um, so, I'm going to just ask uh, one question because it doesn't quite fit exactly in this, but we've had a few uh, questions that have come up uh, just about care of um, transgender individuals. So, Diane, I'm going to pull you back into the conversations before we move on to our next learning objective. Of course. Um, and one is uh, about identifying uh, or asking about um, people's body parts um, and the kind of uh, sex that people have when we're talking to trans uh, women or men, um, how do we, because uh, because a lot of time, or how would how would you recommend engaging That's in those kinds great, of things? Great question. I'm so glad it was asked. So to the person who asked it, thank you. Those are two um, different people. <laughs> there's a, there's a approach that's taken by folks who are, and, and, and this approach is, is relevant not only in the trans community, but maybe for your patients who have had cancer, who may have a prosthesis, who may have had a, something removed due to cancer. We take an organ inventory 
right? And we want to understand, hey, what is what parts does this person have, right? So that we know what parts we need to care for. Um, and an organ inventory isn't a transgender health specific thing. It's it, it exists, like I said, it can help folks who've had cancer as well. Um, but it really would be the way to to approach that. And as far as the question of, um, you know what kind of sex someone's having, you know, that goes back to, there's a, there's a um, illustration I like to share with my students. And that is that to remember that our patients are actually very different from us. Right. And they're going to be very different from each other. So um, it's kind of like the parable of the elephant and the blind men who each uh, wanted to touch the elephant. And one says, Oh, it's a rope. And one says it's a tree. They're all right, but they're all wrong because of the assumptions that they were making. Sex is kind of like that, right? You can't just assume what kind of sex your patients are having and what they're doing is going to be very different than what you're doing. If your patient says it's sex, it is right. So it's about keeping that open, asking some of those open-ended questions at first, uh, whether you're dealing, whether you're uh, interested in exploring reproduction or sexual health or um, the, the mental health component of it, really you have to tailor your sexual health questions and your sexual activity questions based on really what your goal is. And and like you said earlier, Dr. Peak, this is it's a whole other, it's a whole other rabbit hole. It's a whole other lecture for another day, for sure. Thank you so much for just like, you know. Getting us started. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, so we're going to shift into our last learning objective, which is to determine treatment based on social determinants of health and improve accessibility and the success of patient care and outcomes. So um, this, this is our final question. <laughs> so you should see the question on your screen and you can vote now. Um, and so this is, um, this may feel like our most challenging question, who knows, because uh, we, but we're going to talk about these. And the question is, in which of the following ways is cultural competence different from cultural humility? A, cultural competence is knowledge is a knowledge base required to practice cultural humility. B, cultural competence requires awareness of individual differences and cultural humility does not. C, cultural competence is an unachievable concept and cultural humility is a continuous practice. D, cultural competence is an achievable goal and cultural humility is not, or E, I don't know. Okay, Diane, back to you. Okay. Thank <laughs> Can you. Can you talk to us about these two issues? There, um, I think a lot of us are moving from this construct of cultural competence to cultural humility. And so can you tell us the extra work that cultural humility does for us and where it gets us compared to competence and how they're different, how you can apply them to your clinical practice? Just, just tell you us about it. it. Absolutely. So, you know, I think that the first thing to, to keep in mind is just that, um, besides the fact that cultural competence is not an attainable goal, the reason for that is that no community is homogeneous, right? So no community, it, members of a community are not all going to be similar. And this is really where cultural humility comes in, right? I've said it earlier that, and I'm glad to reinforce this, that our patients have information about themselves that we need to know, and we can't possibly know just by looking at them or seeing a demographic uh, um, documentation, right? We, when we employ cultural humility, we avoid assumptions. Uh, and it does take a little more time and energy to make everything explicit. And as a result, cultural humility uh, is a continuous process. All right. So um, that I think that's uh, that, that's a great response. And that's, I think... Um, and it's uh, sort of a mind shift. Um, and I think it, it actually can ease the the burden of feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to know everything about everybody. Um, and it, to thinking, well, it's really a, a state of mind and a sense of openness to trying to recognize that I have these limitations, but I can be open to exploring the individual in front of me. It doesn't um, take the pressure off in that way. Yeah. So, Dr. Richardson, I'm going to pull you back in. Um, and as we move to models of care where patients are truly empowered, 
we can think about cultural safety. And I'm super excited to talk about this. Um, many in our audience may not be familiar with our term, with this term and how it applies to clinical practice. And so what can you tell us about cultural safety? Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Peek. And, and um, you know, similar to it, what the reason this is a paradigm shift is that when we're speaking about cultural sensitivity, awareness, uh, competence, and even humility, which clearly is key as a practitioner, our goal of that continuous practice of humility, it's all about the provider. Whereas cultural safety is actually a shift to the experience of the patient or the client. And so it actually is shifting the power to how is the patient experiencing care? So I often will say, you could feel like you've done an incredible job, like high five, I just rocked that, that was awesome. And then someone might interview the patient as they're re leaving your office or your clinic, and they'll say, that was terrible. I felt completely, um, uh, I, I, nobody, they didn't listen to me. I didn't feel seen as a person. My, you know, my whole self background was not considered. And I felt disempowered. Empowered. So it really is about that shift. We're using it um, a lot now in Canada in the care of Indigenous peoples, but it works broadly, of course, for all communities who've been excluded structurally and experienced discrimination. It actually forces us to consider and 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 gets us to consider the whole the you know the whole uh, care of the patient but also to really consider the power dynamic so who holds the power in that clinician um, patient encounter. It is no matter how you know ex um, uh, educated one might be, what one's background is coming into an into a care experience, into a hospital, into a clinic, getting a vaccine, they're, you're nervous, you're anxious, and there's someone who is actually treating you, caring for you. And so inherently there's that power dynamic. It's heightened significantly when you're from a community that actually continues to experience exclusion, discrimination, racism. So that's why it's such a key concept is to actually shift to considering how is the patient experiencing the care. We're seeing this a little bit, right? When we talk about patient satisfaction surveys, but this is sort of an, an and even more, um, I would say, um, a fulsome description of a patient's experience. Did they feel that they were being listened to? Did they feel cared for in that broad way? And this slide just really does describe many different examples. And I, I do like the first um, the first point on this slide, which is really what are unsafe practices? Those are practices that any actions that diminish, demean, or disempower the cultural identity and well-being of an individual. And going back to what you were talking about earlier, Dr. Peak, around like that humanity, the respectful engagement with the person who, um, you know, whom we're treating or with whom we're entering into that, that, um, that treatment relationship. So just, I think it's a helpful concept to actually shift the focus and just just as we were talking about shifting from the deficit-based model to a strengths-based model within our communities, shifting to, okay, what are the strengths with, with the patient and how do we really allow the patient to, to guide the care that we're providing, obviously, when that shared decision-making model, et cetera. Exactly. And I think this is just a continuum. We, as medical students, are trained to think about, okay, we know we're going to be asking people very sensitive questions. We know we're going to be having difficult questions about the, you know, end of life, et cetera, asking about their sexual practices. Um, and so we need to create sort of safe, you know, spaces. But it's, it's, it's extending this construct to things that we may not be accustomed to asking or talking about, you know, racism, um, heterosexism, um, and to make space um, for people to feel safe about all aspects of who they are. And sometimes we have to explicitly say that um, and, and to understand that patients may not have that as a given that our job is to make them feel safe. You know, and so um, whenever I meet patients um, in the hospital for the first time, I always say things that seem very obvious. Um, my first job is to take the best care I can of uh, your loved one. Um, my, you know, these these things that, you know, like one, two, three. And a lot of times the students are like, yeah, um, but I'm like, you know what? 
nine times out of 10, I bet you the family was not aware of that. <laughs> they may have thought that my first job was to make as money, much money as I could to experiment on their family, to, you know, do whatever. And so um, creating a sense of safety in time of vulnerability and stress, I think is really, really important, particularly for marginalized communities who frequently feel unsafe everywhere they go. Um, and so, so thank you for introducing this construct for us. Um, so Dr. Canterbury, I'm gonna, I feel like I'm tossing the ball to each one of you, you each get a few minutes to rest. Um, talk about some of the tools that providers can use um, when we're thinking about the social determinants of health. Um, what do we have? Um, there are more things coming online, um, things that are now been validated. How can we integrate these tools to begin screening our patients for some of these uh, social needs that they have um, to think about social determinants of health more broadly? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm grateful to see that more and more EHRs are actually integrating and tracking some of these social determinant needs assessments within their software. But as we can see here, we do have other tools like the prepare screening tool, which comes from our NACHC. Um, that's the National Association of Community Health Centers. And it's again, designed to engage patients and really look for some of those core needs we discussed earlier in social determinants. Uh, they use 15 core and five supplemental questions and the beauty about this is it actually comes with an implementation and action toolkit to help upskill the people using the assessments. And of course, it's translatable in a couple of 25 different languages. There's also the AHC, AHRSN screening tool, which comes from our CMS. And this is, again, designed to help assess these needs. And they use a short form, a 10 item short form, uh, and available in 10 languages as well. And lastly, we also have the social needs screening tool, which comes from our um, AAFP. And again, I'm meant for a number of practice settings here. This is an 11 questionnaire, 11 point questionnaire. Um, and again, this needs to be chosen based on a quality of evidence linking me to poor health outcomes and the ability to address real need overall. So I, I do wanna also just highlight, you know, sometimes these screening tools can, kind of forget that a person's in front of you. And so sometimes patients may be seen as, why are you asking me all this? Like, what do you want from this? What are you going to do with this data? So I think I want to highlight the importance of at least connecting the why and not just probing into someone's business, but it may take some, some kind of re-education around this and that, you know, they don't want to, they want to be sure that you're in it for the best of their interests and care. And, and not just as a way to say, hey, you know what? He says these needs, let's you know defer to someone else and, and maybe cause trouble in their mind. And you don't know what people may think. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, me working in the COVID task force, we learned heavily how much the Latino community wasn't sure they can go to these clinics because they may be fearing immigration or ice around the corner just for getting something that was free and available to all, regardless of the education and people saying that what it is, there's still that intrinsic fear. And so in that same vein, some of these screening tools may be seen with apprehension, but they are there and they need to be at least be seen repeatedly as a tool to help advocate and go beyond just the, the white coat syndrome we may have. That was fabulous. Um, thank you. Because as we are trying to help address these unmet needs that patients may have, we also need to be aware that people have a lived experience that may be wholly different than our own. Um, and they may rightfully have apprehensions um, based on current and or historical um, experiences of the community that may make them question um, what may happen to the information, the data um, that we that they may share with them. And so it is the onus is on us to provide culturally safe spaces, to provide the information so that people know um, that this is going to be used to help them directly um, and that uh, will not be used to harm them and their families. Um, so I'm going to jump now <laughs> to talk about why, uh, well, this is sort of obvious, um, but uh, to the issue of diversity and people frequently in their own minds uh, equate them like e equality and equity. Those are different terms, um, disparities and diversity, different terms, um, but they're interrelated. Um, it's because we need a diverse 
workforce to try and combat disparity. So we're going to just do a, a quick sort of uh, acknowledgement. Um, and Diane, I'm going to ask you um, to talk a little bit about diversity um, and why that's important um, and to uh, talk a little bit about your unique program in Yale um, and what some of the things are uh, that you're doing there that can help us towards this goal. That was great. So um, just to share a couple of the actions that we've taken in the PA online program, you know, because this program is the first in the country for medicine anyway, that's online rather than residential for the didactic portion, our applicants don't have to be uprooted. And one of my favorite stories is of a student uh, first in our first cohort who um, lived on a reservation. It was either North or South Dakota and uh, has not gone more than 20 miles beyond their home. And our training in their region. They're not going to be going off someplace and not coming back. They're going to stay in this region. They're going to stay in their area. They train there and they're going to be providing primary care uh, right there at home. And we're doing this in all 50 states, which is just, I, I love this part about the program. Um, because the program is online rather than residential, our applicants don't have to travel to the school for interviews. And that really helps applicants who are first gen and low, in, low uh, resource to cross that threshold to matriculation. During covid every school learned this lesson as well. And I certainly hope that uh, many of them have continued for this very reason. Um, and the last thing I'll share is just that data on our applicant pool revealed that the GRE exam wasn't relevant to student success. So we did away with it. And these just small changes resulted in a greater number of underrepresented minorities in medicine who are now matriculating in our program. This matters, high level summaries, because we know that health outcomes and patient satisfaction are best when the provider represents and reflects their patients. And there's illustrations on the slide in front of you to give a little more detail on that. Great. Um, so now we're going to go to the audience response questions um, and see how we did. Uh, so the first is about equity and equality. Um, so we're going to do this, we're going to revisit. Um, so uh, the first question, um, after watching uh, today's program, hopefully uh, we'll have a, a better sense of how to differentiate those two. So the, you'll have, you see the question in front of you, um, how, do you how do you differentiate equality and equity? And I'll let you read the uh, response options yourself. And so, Dr. Richardson, I'm going to ask you to actually um, uh, talk about the results and see uh, what. Oh, I'm, I'm still, still on mute. mute. Sorry, I was having trouble oh. getting off of mute there. Okay. Um, so, what we're seeing in this is that um, uh, the after the results of, after this session, 81% of people felt that equity allocates resources to account for individual differences to achieve equal outcomes for all. And that's amazing. That's the correct answer. And prior to this, at the beginning of the session, only 61% of people got that. So that is actually a really cool and amazing result. And I love that there's been that evolution and, and growth both in people's thinking um, through the course of, of this session. So uh, congratulations, everyone, for this learning and obviously to all the co-presenters. Yay, hooray. <laughs> okay. So uh, as we come around the bin, we're going to ask the second question. Um, race is a biological risk factor for which of the following disease states? A, oh, I'll let you guys uh, read them yourself and... And Dr. Canterbury, I'm going to ask you to look at the results. Okay. All right. So for our pre and post, looks like we have 69% pre, now 65% post for sickle cell disease. Uh, regarding HIV infection, 2% uh, pre, 7% post, 4% pre, 5% post for diabetes, and which we all want, none of the above, 
uh, for 23% post and 14% pre uh, as race being a biological risk factor. All right, so uh, making some progress. Um, let's uh, go to the third question. Um, after today's program, which of the following groups do you think experience the greatest mental health disparities? And someone actually had a question about this or a comment about this. Um, so I hope they're still with us. Um, so we have four options. Take a look at that and go ahead and um, vote. And Diane, I'll ask you to comment on these when they come up. So they're up and there's been a slight increase among the respondents. Uh, started out with 74% saying pre and 81% post for identifying uh, transgender persons as uh, experienced great um, mental health related disparities. So well done attendees. <laughs> well done. All right. Someone had thought that uh, they were like, so you mean to tell me that non-Hispanic white males have the greatest? <laughs> so <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't the answer. OK, uh, two last questions. Um, after watching now, which of the following do you think is not a social determinant of health domain? Four responses. Go ahead and pick. Dr. Richardson, I'll be back to you. So just interpreting the results. So the correct answer to this question is, uh, and the question was, which of them is not a social determinant, which is not, not a social determinant of health? The correct answer is race and ethnicity. And once again, I'm lucky out here with showing the uh, response that has massive growth. So prior to at the beginning of this session, 44% of people got that question were correct in that in that question and at the end we've got 67% of you who have um who have had that uh, got the answer right so really really cool to see um again the educational impact of this session so congrats everyone wonderful all right now the last one finally um after today's program. So which do you think is the difference between cultural competence and cultural humility? Um, again, four questions. Pick yours. And Dr. Canterbury, I'll give this one back to you. Okay, so uh, for the answer, cultural competence is an un unachievable concept and cultural humility is a continuous practice. So, so glad that we've seen a huge growth, 54% post, and before it was 18% pre. So I think we've made some good ground in breaking that distinction. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So happy, happy, happy that we're doing some good learning. All right, so we're going to summarize our discussion, which has been long and interesting and great and just juicy um, <laughs> with our SMART goals, which are, which means or stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And so that is what I hope that you take from today's presentation and apply to your practice. So first, uh, recognize that disparities related to race, ethnicity, age, gender identity, and or sexual orientation result in health equities in your practice, everyone's practice. A second, um, evaluate your personal implicit and explicit biases related to underserved populations in your care community. Additionally, screen patients for social determinants of health or unmet social needs um, to understand and accommodate circumstances that serve as barriers to healthcare access and quality. Importantly, collaborate with the entire care team from administrative staff to individual specialists, develop a team-based approach to care that seeks to remove barriers to health equity. And then finally, continually practice cultural humility um, and create culturally uh, 
uh, safe spaces um, during patient encounter interactions to improve the patient experience. And so, uh, so that's it. <laughs> we can, uh, well, we're really past our time. So what I will just say is um, to Diane, Delon, and Lisa, thank you so much for the work that you all do day in and day out to help empower your patients and to improve their care. It really, really has been an honor sharing this time with you um, tonight. Um, I also just want to remind our audience that CME Outfitters has a diversity and inclusion hub with several more educational activities and really excellent resources to share with your colleagues and patients. And you spent a lot of time with us this evening. So please receive your CME or CE credit for today's program. Um, please complete the post-test and evaluation. Thank you again to everyone who participated in today's program. Thank you for sharing this space with me and for your continued commitment to improving the care for all of our patients. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, guys.